right. So, uh, let's see. Let's see if we are live. I sure hope we are. Welcome, welcome. I'm going to go ahead and check on our Facebook page to make sure that we are live. I certainly hope we are. <laughs> one minute we are live it looks like we're live so I am so excited today I have such an amazing guest and and Ashley I met Ashley at an ACT we we're both uh, first year students with Dan McCollum and Bethany Hicks um, and I'm just so impressed by her. She's a young lady. She's on a mission and um, and with no further ado hi Ashley. Hi, Teresa. It's really great to be here today. It's an honor. Oh, well, thank you for being on with us. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, my name is Ashley Griffith. I am from Ohio. Um, I am married with three young daughters, uh, seven, five, and three. And um, yeah, I, I just wanted to start out this entire interview by saying that I, I grew up in a wonderfully loving Christian home um, around a loving Christian community. So, uh, I grew up in church. I, I, I've loved the Lord since as long as I can remember, I've always had a love for the scriptures. Um, my parents raised me on adventures and odyssey and focus on the family movies. Um, I just, I just knew the Bible from a very young age. I've had amazing experiences with, with God in our services and even, um, church camps and by myself in my, my bedroom and my car. So, um, I've had a, an upgrade bringing that was, um, loving and Christian and yeah, I just knew I was blessed growing up. I went to, um, I went to college at Ohio university in Athens, Ohio. I got my bachelor's in English there. I got my master's at the university of Essex in England. So, um, yeah, I've had a really great, wonderful life, to be honest with you. So, yeah. That is that is awesome. That is awesome. So we're going to be talking about legalism in the church, but we're also going to be talking about the process of, of getting free from that and how to recognize it, because sometimes it's hidden and we don't know. And for us, we're always, you know, walking with the Lord and wanting to do our best, you know, our best in life walking. Right. Them and give him our best but legalism is very sneaky and it has snuck into the church not only in our generations as we were talking earlier but so many generations past even down to the pharisees so we're going to talk a little bit about that and um and just uncover that and then talk about some truth in scripture. So what brought you to the point of writing a book about legalism in the church and what is the name of your book my name, the name of my book is called The Elephant in the Room. Subtitle is a open-hearted commentary to my generation on legalism in the church. Because you're right, legalism has been there from the beginning. But what I felt like the Lord has said to me is that it is a cancer in his body and we're at stage four. Wow. And if we don't deal with this, it's it's going to take us out. Yeah. And it has impacted generations of Christians, but I really just feel that it's, it's to the point, like, I believe the millennial generation has felt the full force of legalism. It has choked the majority of my generation out of their faith in God, out of the church. Um, and th the Barna group, I don't know if you're familiar with the Barna group, but they do, um, surveys of just surveys about the Christian, uh, culture, Christianity, and, um, they, they found that millennials have walked away from God in droves and that Gen Z is considered atheist, um, which means really awful things for Gen Alpha, which are my children. Yeah. So I, this just can't be the, the, the gospel that turned the first century church upside down is bleeding eternal souls like this. There's something wrong. Right. And so I just believe that the Lord uh, has opened my eyes to um, a facet of of the issue. And I do believe that legalism is a big part of the reason why we're losing so many people. And the only way I know this is because he's opened my eyes to it. 
So like I said, I grew up in church, but um, January 1st, 2022. So I was 38 years old. I'm 40 now, um, <clears throat> 38 years old. And he sent me a dream and I've never dreamed of Jesus before, but he showed up in this dream. And I, the dream started out third person. It was like I was in a movie theater and I was watching myself with Jesus next to me, looking at a three to four foot tall clay pot. And so I was just kind of me looking down at the two of us standing at this clay pot. And when the both of us started to move to look into the pot, it went third person. And so then he was next to me and I was looking into the pot with him. And down at the bottom of the pot was a hole the size of a man's hand. And it was on like a pallet. So I could, so it was above the ground and I, I could see the ground and I could see water pooling out of the hole. And then Luke Skywalker walked behind me and I woke up. Wow. It was like a fast dream and I knew it happened. I mean, it felt like it happened right before I woke up. And the fact that Jesus was in it and it just was so full of symbolism, I was like, this is an important dream. And wow. I dream a lot. I used to dream a lot more. Um, but I knew this dream was, was important. And so, um, I was still working at the time. And when I finally got to my desk to work that day, the first thing I did was write my dream down and just to remember every detail of it. And, um, then ask the Holy spirit, what, what is this dream? Who is the pot? Why was there a hole in the bottom? Why was there water? Why was Luke Skywalker there? And <laughs> the, um, the interpretation came instantly. And it just like, it was just like, it, it just poured over me. And, um, what he told me was that I was the clay pot, which makes sense because second Corinthians four, seven says that we are earthen vessels with a treasure inside and, and what was going on inside the pot was of interest, right? So at the very beginning, the outside of the pot did not matter. It was what was going on inside the pot that he was looking at, yeah. right? Okay. So that, you know, legalism is focused on the outward. It's tethered to the earthly. It's tethered to the scene. But what this dream was showing me was what was inside of the pot was the focus. That's where he was looking. And so the water going out of the pot was the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is described as water in scripture. And so I knew it was the Holy Spirit and it was just draining out of the bottom of my pot and the hole at the bottom of the pot. First of all, the fact that it was on the bottom said to me that this was a foundational issue mm. that whatever I was building my life on the foundation of it was compromised. Mm. And as I was writing about my dream, he said that this is a fatal flaw. And so it was very like sobering yeah. and, and what then I heard. So this is everything that was just like coming to me understanding. And what I heard him say is as long as, um, as long as everything in your relationship with me depends on what, on your performance every day and not on my perfect performance on the cross, everything I pour into you is just going to flow out of the bottom of your pot and you will never experience those rivers of living water flowing out of your belly. Oh. And I immediately, it was like light shone down from heaven. I knew exactly what he was talking about. And I, and I wrote the word legalism in my journal. I was like, he's talking about legalism. And at the time I didn't completely understand what legalism was the way I do now. Right. But I knew I was, I knew that's what he was talking about was that my focus and my relationship with him was on my performance and making sure that I did everything right. And that I crossed all the T's and dotted all the I's and he called this a fatal flaw. And so it was like, what do you mean fatal? <laughs> like, fatal means deadly. You know, are you, are you saying my salvation is, 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 is like in question here? I found a very interesting verse in uh, Job, Job 33, 14 through 18. What I realized was that it, with this dream, he'd actually been talking to me about this for decades. I'm a writer. And so I, I journal all the time. And even though I'm writing this book right now, the truth is I've been writing this book for two decades because I really started in my twenties to be like, 
I don't know about this. You know, I don't know about this, but one of the things legalism does is it shuts down your, your ear to recognizing the Holy spirit to know that he's talking. So my questions, you know, were like, I felt guilty about them. Um, like I shouldn't be questioning this. I shouldn't be, you know, and a lot of us growing up, we talk about this stuff in hushed whispers. We're just like, do you believe in this? And I'm like, I don't know, you know, because, you know, talking to my peers, we weren't really allowed to ask questions about these rules that we were raised to follow. I grew up in the United Pentecostal church. And so there there's, we have a list of, you know, a dress code, um, lifestyle rules. And one of the things I've realized is that our parents actually don't seem to realize that these are salvation issues in my generation. Like we are afraid we we've been afraid that if we don't follow these rules, we'll go to hell. Right. So questioning these rules is kind of like, Oh, you know, and some of us, um, when we've questioned, we've just been told just obey, like stop asking questions, stop rocking the boat, just obey. Others of us have been, you know, uh, you know, told like it's, it's rebellious to ask questions. You can't ask questions about this. You just do obey and, and your understanding will come in, in, in your, your Christian walk. You're not going to understand everything. You just obey and understanding will come. Okay. Okay. Um, but I, I am a thinker. And so just in my journals, I would, you know, and I realized now that was the Holy spirit, like pushing me to read, pushing me to study, pushing me to find answers. And so this, this verse in Job, Job 33, 14 through 18, it says, for God speaks in one way and in two, though man does not perceive it in a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls on man, while they slumber on their beds, then he opens the ears and terrifies them with warnings that he may turn man aside from his deed. He keeps back his soul from the pit, his life from perishing by the sword. So he had been speaking to me for two decades and I'm just like, you know, like, I don't know, is that you God, you know? And so he had to come to me in a dream finally. And he called this hole a fatal flaw. And I knew that I was at a crossroads at this dream because I, I was given a line in the sand. Either you can continue, he said, either you can continue down the path you're on um, or you can turn a hard left and follow me. But if you stay on the path you're on, you're going to miss everything I have for you. And I don't know everything. Does that mean salvation? Again, that fatal flaw. I was just like, what do you mean by that? Well, I um, later encountered, encountered Hebrews 10, 26 to 29. It says, for if we go on willfully and deliberately sinning, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains sacrifice to atone for our sins. That is, there's no further offering to anticipate, but a kind of awful and terrifying expectation of divine judgment and the fury of a fire and burning, which will consume the adversaries of those who put themselves in opposition to God. Anyone who has ignored or set aside the law of Moses is put to death without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much greater punishment do you think he will deserve who has rejected and trampled underfoot the son of God and has considered unclean and common the blood of the covenant that sanctified him and has insulted the spirit of grace who imparts unmerited favor and blessing of God. So what that's, what that's saying is if God reveals the truth of you, uh, reveals the knowledge of God to you, the truth, and you reject it. You're insulting the spirit of grace and you can't expect there to be another atonement for your sin. He's warned you like, Hey, and so that was very serious. And then I remember the day I was, um, I had, I was reading in revelation and I read revelation 22, 14 to 15, blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates outside are the dogs and sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. So I read that. And then I got in the shower, um, as a mom, that's really where I hear from God the most clearly. And he emphasized practices falsehood. You know, you're living a lie. And the, the, the ones who knowingly live a lie are the ones I do not allow into my kingdom. And I literally had a panic attack. <laughs> like I was like, I, I couldn't breathe. And I was like shaking and I was scared. And, and I, and I, and I like said to my husband, I was like, listen, you know, and he was like, 
just calm down. Like he thought I was crazy. He didn't understand what was going on at the time, but he was terrifying me honestly is what was happening. Like you have to make this decision. And that's literally what it means about when he says he goes after the lost sheep, the sheep that goes astray, he will do absolutely everything he can to bring you back onto that straight and narrow and, 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 and into that lighted path of the truth of God, his word is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. And we so easily veer off of that path. And he, so he just, he was, you know, at this point after two decades of just kind of like, like, come on, Ashley, come on. He sent a dream and he terrified me. <laughs> so I, I, I just said yes. And I knew I was saying yes to things that I desperately wanted a life of freedom and just autonomy and being able to make decisions, um, for myself about certain things. And I knew that this was going to require me make outward changes that was going to cause people to notice, you know, cause at this point I was doing some things and I was able to hide it. Um, and they were not sinful things, just like decisions. You know, I, I had, I had, you know, broken I was breaking our rules in ways but hiding it and that's what he was saying is you're living a lie and and it's time to be who I've created you to be so that's where the book came from long answer to that that is amazing so those of you you that are watching right now um you know we are talking about legalism and legalism you know it comes from within us you know, it comes from within us. We are taught that some sometimes externally, but really it is what Ashley is saying, that it is a choice for us to throw off those old garments and then to walk in, walk in the light and the gift of God. Because yeah. um, it, the scriptures also say that um, salvation is a gift of God, of God so that no man can boast. Right. You know, I did this, this and that. Therefore, I, you know, I, yeah. I'm eligible you know, for salvation, but it is right. a game that we can't brag. But in a nutshell, um, just explain to our community just legalism and just its definition. Sure. Legalism is the strict, literal, or excessive conformity to the law or a religious moral code. Okay. Yeah. And it is inherent in us. That's one of the things that he he's taught me about legalism is that it was actually there in Eve in the garden. Yeah. It's, it's just wired into us. Um, as at, I mean, I don't think he wires it, it into us necessarily, but, um, do you want me to explain that? What he showed me about Eve? Oh, sure. That, yeah. So, um, where did, where did this like legalistic impulse come from? Um, so if you go to Eve in the garden and, um, she, she, you know, Jesus, God, God told them to, you know, they could freely eat of any of the trees in the garden, right? A very abundant, free access to absolutely everything in the garden. And we know that in the garden, there were, there were two trees in the middle, in the center of it, the tree of life, which they could freely eat from. And then the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which they were not permitted to eat from. And so, um, the Bible says that the serpent targeted Eve, like he, he didn't go to Adam. He went to Eve and, um, and he asked the question, did God really say that you can't eat of every tree? Basically he spun the words and I think he was vetting Eve. I, I, I he's just looking for a way in. Right. <laughs> so she said, actually, so she said, um, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you, sh and then she starts quoting God. This is in quotes. You yeah. shall not eat of the treat of the, tr the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it lest you die. Well, you know, God never said anything about touching the fruit. He just said, don't eat the fruit. So for the serpent, that was his way in. Yeah. adding to what God said, this excessive conformity to the law. Um, and it came from her desire to, to, to like obey him well, right. So in her mind, she was like, this is going to kill me. I don't even know if she comprehended what that is dying, but it sounded bad. And so if you said, don't eat it, I'm not even going to touch it. And so that's excessive conformity and it's putting words in God's mouth. It's adding to what he said. And it's, and it comes from this desire 
to serve God well and love him well and obey him well. But when you veer off of what God actually says, you, you, you know, that's, I call it the lighted path of truth. Um, you, you move into the, you know, you become vulnerable and you move into this, this, um, this place where you're way more open to deception and error. And that is where the enemy slipped in and said, you're not going to die. Lie number one. He just knows if you eat of the fruit, you'll be like him. Lie number two, because Eve was already like him. Eve was made in his image. She had the breath of God flowing through her body, which are two things that not even Lucifer and all of his beautiful glory could boast of. He wasn't made in the image of God and God didn't breathe life into him. That's something that we humans uniquely have, which is why he hates us so much. So Eve didn't, if Eve knew I'm already in the image of God, I, I'm already like him. What are you talking about? Would that deception have worked? I don't know. But what he taught me was that that legalistic impulse is just in you as humans because you want to serve me well. But that's where the enemy can slip in. Gotcha. And and so just give us one uh, life experience that you had where you were deceived into believing a falsehood and then you found out, oh, my gosh, I'm not free in this area. Uh, and how did you find freedom? So give us an example of that in your own life. Um, I think one of the, the most obvious things about, um, uh, the United Pentecostal church in particular is just their teaching that women shouldn't cut their hair. Um, and they root this in first Corinthians 11, there's 16 verses, maybe it's 13 verses there. That's where they pull this teaching out of. And they teach, you know, the scripture says that women's hair should be long and men's hair should be short. And if you cut your hair, it's the same thing as shaving it. And that this gives you power with the angels and all that stuff. And so I believed that willingly. I taught that willingly for um, probably 30 years or so. I'm going to assume maybe it was less, maybe 25 years. Um, but I was one of those people whose hair just did not stop growing. <laughs> like, my hair got past my knees and I it just was so annoying to be perfectly honest with you. It was so much work. Yeah, so yeah. Much work. It takes forever to fix long hair, you know? Um, and so it just became like this ugh, burden. And in my twenties, I did start kind of researching this, um, and researched it consistently for the next, you know, let's see, 11 years before I like really came to the conclusion, like scriptures, do not teach this. It just absolutely does not teach that a woman shouldn't cut their hair. And so I knew this for a few years before I actually did cut my hair, but having my first daughter um, and having a newborn and all the sleep deprivation and all the newness and all the demand and all that stuff, dealing with four and a half feet of hair on top of that, I was just over it. And at that point, like my heart was bitter about the issue anyway. Like I was, I was angry about it. I was bitter and I knew the Lord looks at your heart. You know, man looks at the outward appearance. I knew the Lord was looking at my heart and my heart was in such a bad place over this issue. And so finally, just the, the straw that broke the camel's back for me was have had having this newborn and just not being able to deal with my hair anymore. Um, yeah. so on, um, what is it? May 17th? No, May 22nd, 2017. Yeah. I got my hair cut you know, to the bout, you know, just below my waist. And it was just this amazing feeling of freedom because I did it in faith. Yeah. Romans 14, the very last verse in Romans 14 says, anything you don't do in faith is sin, mm -hmm. right? And so, and in Romans 14 says that you must be, um, let every man be, um, let every man be like assured in his own mind about his beliefs. Yeah. Right. And so that's one of the things that I think legalism strips from us is our ability to come to our own conclusions about things that just kind of gives you like, this is how, this is what the end result is. Um, you are ultimately going to come to this conclusion. We're just going to give you that conclusion at the front end and eventually you'll get there. But yeah. that strips us of the luxury of working out our own salvation with fear and trembling, coming to our own conclusions. And so we're actually not doing these things from a place of faith. And right. Romans 14 says it's sin. If you're not doing something in a place of faith, you're sinning. So right. 
um, I was in sin for that very reason. And so my faith that cutting my hair wasn't wrong and then doing it right. Your faith is the action that flows from your beliefs. I was, that's why I experienced so much joy and freedom from that. And it was like, that was like one of my big first steps, like into my freedom. And that was when I was 32. So it took the dream when I was 38 to really like lift the veil completely and me really forced me out of hiding because my hair was long enough that I could still hide that it was cut. Yeah. So long. I can't believe you had hair that long. Oh my gosh. Well, that's a lot of work. And I think you have a picture on your Facebook wall yeah. of yourself with long hair. I'm just like, oh my gosh, that is yeah, just uh that's very strict. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Like, some women's hair is way longer. Some women's hair don't doesn't grow very long at all, you know. But my hair is the one my hair didn't stop growing. <laughs> so yeah. and you know, when I think of people your age that you know, come into the Lord, you know, I'm quite a bit older than you and, and, um, and gosh, they want to experience relationship. They want a real connection. They want to see signs and wonders. They want to see miracles. They want to see God move. They want to live every day. And I'll give you an example. I was at church last Sunday and the worship music came on and I was just engulfed I love worship so I'm worshiping and I'm kind of looking up in the ceiling and I'm just worshiping it's such a beautiful atmosphere and I hear Jesus speak and he's like why are you worshiping this way when I'm inside oh. and my, I, I it really did take me back and I started to cry and I thought you know, you are inside. Wherever I am, there you are. And here I am looking at the ceiling and, and outward when he's right here. And I think about your generation and that's what they need. They need to know wherever they go, they're never alone. Wherever they go, they 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 can feel and know that Jesus is with them. The Holy Spirit abides from, from within, not from without. Right. So, um, I, I just feel like the Lord spoke to me in that time to mention that on, on this live that we're doing today, that gosh, a lot of things that we do, the outward, as you were speaking about earlier, you know, it doesn't, it, it, it's not, um, you know, at the end of the age, everything that we do will be burned up and, and see what gold comes out, you know, what was done with the pure heart and pure motives. And sometimes, you know, in our immaturity, we do things to be seen or do things to be heard because of lack of identity or, um, you know, we're, we're crossing all of our boxes that we, okay, I prayed today, I, I read two scriptures, I did this, I did that, I did this, and I did that. And there's a scripture that Jesus is talking about, and it, and, and it never left me, because mm -hmm. it says, it says um, I never knew you. Right. He didn't, say, he didn't say, you never knew me. Mm. He said, I never knew you. And mm. so when I dug in with the Lord, he's like, yes, because people walk through life, and they're walled, and they do outward things, but they never knew me. I never knew them. They didn't let me in, mm -hmm. you know, they didn't let me into their heart. They just did the routines, and I read the chapter, and I went to church, and I'm checking my boxes and all of that, those things, you know, and missing it, just really missing the purpose of the cross and missing that everyday relational aspect of wherever I am, there he is, you exactly. know can't hide from him we can't run from him he is there and his goodness leads us into repentance truly yes. it really does he's been so good to me over so many years but you know just what living a life and not knowing that we're not allowing him to know us really that scripture really stayed with me because gosh I want him inside of the struggles and the victories and the hardships and the tears and all of that I don't want to just buckle up my boots and just act like everything's okay I want because I'm inviting him into those places in the journey with him and so I really appreciate where you're coming from and saying hey let's get rid of that let's let's really worship him in spirit and in truth from the inside um not as if he's a God that's outside of our being. Right. You know? so good. 
Well, he, he, I love that. Yeah. At the end, he doesn't say, well done. You never messed up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No? He says, well done, you know, good and faithful servant enter into your rest. Um, yeah. He's not looking to see whether we messed up and see that is the culture, the atmosphere in which um, that's the atmosphere. Legalistic approach really does foster is I can't make a mistake because so much is riding on me doing this right. And, and so one of the things that my generation does not understand is the cross. We right. don't actually understand what the cross did for us and we don't understand his grace. I I've only just come to this understanding in the last two years. And I'm like, this is amazing news because I really think in, in a lot of ways, I was the poster child for or this, this lifestyle, I, I did, I'm a firstborn perfectionist people pleaser. I think that that's like, um, that comes naturally for firstborns. You're raised with adults. So you want to please them. You want to show them you're doing all the right things. And, um, I'm like, you can ask my parents, I'm the first person to come to my own defense. Like, no, I wasn't trying to be bad when I did that wrong. I want you to see this from my side. Like my heart is good. I don't want you to think bad about me when I, you know, whenever they're disciplining me about something and, and see, that's because your self-worth mm. is resting on how well you did that day on your performance. Did I read my Bible? Was I kind to everybody? You know, I, I, I would punish myself for any infraction. I would punish myself and I would avoid God until I felt like I atoned for my own sin. And when I felt like I've had a great stretch of days, I can approach God because I've done well. I didn't understand that. Like he imparted his righteousness to me. Yeah. Yeah. Right? He, took, he took that. And he gave me the righteousness of God and the holiness of God. See, our, our list of rules in the United Pentecostal Church are called holiness standards. So if you say <laughs> these rules, the implication, and they, and they might like, no, that's what, what, not what we mean. I'm yeah. trying to say that this is the message that we have received as millennials. The, yeah. the rules, you know, the more rules you follow, the more holy you are. And if you break them, you're not holy. Yeah. And that's how holiness works. Holiness is separation from you know, the common for the sacred, yes. right? It's purity. It's not mixture. And so because we've reduced holiness to an outward appearance, I, I'm seeing clearly now that there's actual mixture in our teaching and our ministry and our approach. Like we are mixing light and dark and so much of what we do, because we don't understand that. We don't really understand what holiness truly is. And yeah. so that was, that's another revelation I've had is like, Holiness is just being set apart from unto something and actually holiness is perfected in the fear of the Lord. And the other thing that legalism does is you just fear man, <laughs> you fear man more than anything. And, and man becomes the, the, the standard man becomes the judge. It's, it's just, it's not how the kingdom of God works. You know, we're citizens of the kingdom of God and not, not this earth, not the kingdom of darkness. So that's so good. And just to be clear that the pendulum can't swing completely one way or completely live a sloppy life. Do you know what I mean? Rules and regulations. And then, okay, well, I'll just do what I want to do. You know what I mean? Because there's consequences to doing right. bad. If you do bad, there, there's just a natural, you know, consequence. You know, you yeah. can drive. Hey, there's a consequence if you get pulled over and, you know, you, right. could, you could ruin your, your life, you know. With, with bad choices. Um, so we're not saying this or, or going the other way, but it really is finding out who you are in Christ and really knowing that I don't have to walk a tightrope with the Lord because gosh, he already knows. Mm -hmm. He knows before we even think them. And yeah. so don't have to live uh, a tightrope mm -hmm. with the Lord because that's, that's not freedom and that's not what he died for. And so, um, power is made perfect in our weakness. And so I feel like the, the kind of the atmosphere in which, um, we, I was raised and it's not because anyone's bad or malicious or evil. It's just this legalistic, like you just have to do it this way. And this is how we stand right with God. It doesn't allow for imperfection in ourselves. And we we're just pretending all the time. And 
I don't mean to insult anyone by saying that. And so maybe I can just say I was pretending all the time, you know, because I didn't want people to see because your worth depends on whether and your salvation even depends on whether you do well. So I can't let people see my weakness. I yeah. can't let them see that because so much is riding on me and my own, my own righteousness. But Paul said, I actually boast in my weakness because I know that's how God's power is manifest through my life. And the Bible also says, confess your faults to one another that you may be healed. Well, if we're not being authentic with ourselves, because we can't bear to let God see, like yeah. if we're paying for our own sin. We're not going to let him deal with it. Right. Well, we're certainly not talking to each other about our faults or there are accepted sins that we're allowed to gripe about, but not like the real deep stuff. Like you can't, you can't admit everything, you know, there's accepted sins and there's not. So if we're not confessing our faults to one another, we're not finding healing, you know, and that's just another thing that I found, I, I realized about this environment. Is sin, sin we, we want to cover it in the mm -hmm. garden and just wanting to cover our sin and not talk about the weaknesses or the things that we're going through and just pretend like everything is okay and, and things like that. And that is definitely hiding. And so that's not, that's not good. So is legalism really a big deal? What are the negative consequences of it? So that's my next question for you. Yeah. So it actually is a bigger deal than I realized. Um, first and foremost, Ephesians 2, 8 says that we're saved by faith in God's grace, mm. right? I was trying to be saved by my faith and my performance. Wow, that's that's such a weight that Jesus didn't uh, put on you. That right. is weight. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So again, coming back to the fatal flaw, <laughs> all of my efforts and for how perfectly, and I was reading my Bible. I loved going to church. I was in leadership, you know, but, and I believe that he died for my sin, but the, the implied message with all these rules is that part of it is on your shoulders. Like you have to, you have, you carry some of this, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, especially because, you know, so much, so many of my generation believe that this is a, you know, a lot of this can be a heaven or hell thing. Um, and so, so, so yeah, so I was putting a lot of emphasis on my own performance. So I was seeking salvation through my faith in my performance when you're only saved through faith in God's grace. So if I was depending on my own performance and rejecting the very thing that the Bible says saves me. Was I saved? I don't know. I don't know how you would have judged me at the end. I don't know, but I'm just saying like, I was not putting my faith in the right place. Right. You're putting so, your faith in yourself to check all the boxes and to exactly you know, with God. Yeah. Gosh. So that that that's a big deal to me. Um and the other thing is that um legalism tethers us to the physical realm where the emphasis really needs to be on the inner man, the unseen and the spirit realm. So second Corinthians 4 18 says, We fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. Forever. There's another verse in scripture where, where Paul's like, why are we placing so much emphasis on the temporal things? Those are going to pass away, right? So why is there so much emphasis on hair and whether or not I'm in a skirt and whether or not I'm wearing jewelry, like this stuff's going to burn one day. The eternal world is the unseen world. And you mentioned that fire, that judgment fire that's in first Corinthians three, our works are going to be judged by fire and the stone and the wood and the stubble is going to be burnt away. And only what is lasting will remain. Well, if we're just so focused on building this earthly temple and not focused on like this internal temple, then, then we've got our focus in the wrong place. Second Corinthians five, 16 through 17 says from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once even regarded Christ according to the flesh, we don't do that any longer. If anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. So we're not even supposed to look at people in the flesh and make judgments. We're actually supposed to tap into the spirit realm, use our spiritual gifts, and see them in the eye, with the eyes of the spirit. How does heaven see that person? And yeah. that's how we're supposed to relate to each other. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, we live by faith, not by what our eyes see. And then in 1 Samuel 16, 7, the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward opinion 
or appearance and the Lord looks at the heart. So legalism just tethers you to the physical yeah. and at the detriment of the spiritual. And so, I mean, that's why Jesus said to the Pharisees, you're whitewashed tombs. You look great on the outside, but you are dead man's bones on the inside. Yes. And I could see that. I could, I, these last two years, he has done so much inner work in me because, because of his grace and realizing like, I am his daughter. He loves me. I am fully accepted. Um, I'm fully loved and he paid for every sin. And so all of the flaws that are inside of me, he wants to take that and like heal me and, and I'm safe. Like he's not going to condemn me. And so he has done so much deep heart work in me over the last two years, because I finally, like you said, the veil came down. There's actual intimacy. Now I let him go into those deep wounds, those deep insecurities and let him root them out and replace it with his truth and his nature. And so freedom is a, a it's a, it's a work from within. Yeah, it is. It is. And that's the freedom that I want my people to understand, you know, <laughs> like yeah. it's beautiful. It is. So what is the remedy for legalism? Um, let's talk about, we talked about what it, what it is and, and, and checking the boxes and everything. And, and, uh, but what is the remedy, not only for your generation, but the generation before you, behind you, um, you know, what, what is the uh, remedy? Well, the first, the first um, remedy, in, in my opinion, and I know this is big with you, Teresa, your whole platform is centered around this is our heavenly identity yes. is knowing who God created us to be. So one of the most, one of the other significant parts of this journey. So January 1st, 2022, I had the dream and the dream, like I, I started to feel that freedom and walk into it, but I was still grappling. Like I just couldn't, I don't, and there were just things I couldn't wrap my head around. Like I, I can't, can I really do this without man's permission? Can I really, cause my impulse was to go to people and be like, listen, I had this dream and these are people that I respect and love, but also the Lord revealed that I feared. I didn't want to lose their good opinion. Yeah. Right. And so crossing this line and making choices that are going to be very outwardly obvious. Yeah. I wanted to go to these people and be like, listen, you know, here comes my self-defense. Yeah. I'm not rebelling. I'm not walking away. Um, I just, the Lord came to me in a dream. And this is what he said to me. Actually, God told me not to do that. He said, you have my approval. Mm. I have approved you and I've given you permission. So I want you to obey without going to these people. Um, because really what that is, is a fear of man. And that's the, that's one of the big things that he's been rooting out of me in the, these last two years is the fear of man. And he actually showed me Luke 16, 15, he was talking to the Pharisees and he said, you are the ones who justify yourselves before men. Um, he said, God knows your heart. What is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. And so it's Pharisaical actually to justify yourself before men. Because this is your attempt to, to look good in their eyes still, right? And that's that was my whole life. I yeah. was like always defending myself. Yeah. And so he was like, I'm your defense. Mm -hmm. Obey me. You have my permission. And I want you to walk this out without going to people and, and telling them. I just, the other thing he was trying to do in me was um, cultivate meekness. Mm. Weakness is the willingness to in, in experience or endure injury without retaliation. Yes. Right? yes. Um, I was anything but meek. I, I like to say I'm half Scottish. My mom's side of the family, I'm 50% Scottish. Like the Scots aren't meek people. They're going to be like, Grr, you know, and ask anyone that knows me well, like I will come to my own defense instantly. And, and he's been dealing with me on that. So part of this whole process I had to do it without explaining myself yeah. without people knowing that everyone's going to be like what is going on with her and just coming to the wrong conclusions maybe talking about me and I had to find my complete and total acceptance in the fear of God fear of man is a snare 
And that has done a lot to break the fear of man off of me. All of that to say is that I was grappling with that from the moment of my dream um, until I received a prophetic word um, on August 11th, 2022. So eight months later, and it was all about heavenly identity. It was, this is who God sees you as Ashley. This is who God says you are. And I, I could not believe how he saw me. I couldn't believe how he created me. It was this, like, you've got to be kidding me. Right. Um, and that was a life-changing moment. And then Bethany Hicks, our, our mentor in ACT, um, when she said, you have divine permission to be everything God's created you to be, it was like the missing puzzle piece. I don't know. I don't know why it took so long to see it. But when she said that, I'm just like, I have permission to be who God created me to be. So one of the um, remedies to legalism is just understanding who God says you are and feeling the permission to blossom into that. You know, that's a process of transformation and sanctification. One of my life verses is Ephesians 2.10. And it says that you are God's masterpiece recreated in Christ Jesus. That means you are born from above. You are born from above and you've been renewed. So this is identity. You're, you are a masterpiece. So he made you to be something. This is your identity. And he did this so that you could do good works. Well, that's your purpose. That's your destiny, um, for which God prepared beforehand. Take This is in the Amplified, taking paths which he set so that we would walk in those paths that he's prepared for us in advance. He's pre prearranged this good life for us. But the implication is that you have to become who he's created you to be in order to access those paths. So the way I like to say it is that your heavenly identity is the key that unlocks your destiny. And the more you become this key, the more of your destiny unlocks, right? And so when it comes to young adults, um, I have a real heart for young adults. I think sometimes we approach it backwards. We're like, well, what do you want to do with your life? What are you going to do? And the question really needs to be, who does God say you are? Because your purpose flows from your identity. And then Matthew 5, 16 says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father in heaven. So there's that order again, your light shines. That's your heavenly identity. Um, 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says, for God who said, let brilliant light shine out of darkness is the one who has cascaded his light into us. So the light inside of us is from him. And this is the brilliant dawning light of the glorious knowledge of, of God. And so the light that we each carry is a portion of the light of the knowledge of God that he gives to us and no one else. And he wants that light to shine out of us uniquely. If we don't shine that portion of light that he's given us, the world will not see that portion of the knowledge of God. And so that's why it says, shine your light. And I'm going to put you on a lampstand because you're going to show the world me, yes. right? One of the things legalism does with its outward focus is it snuffs out that light by forcing you into a mold of some kind. And it doesn't necessarily take into account individuality and natural bents, you know, especially if it goes outside of the rules, it's like, no, you can't do that. This is the way you go. And it's a rigid, you, everyone looks the same. <laughs> so, um, so the, the light that God has given you to express is either completely snuffed out or it's not shining as brightly as it should. And so heavenly identity is seeing people the way God sees them and fostering that light to just shine and knowing who you are, right? Like I said, if Eve knew that she was in the image of God, she wouldn't have perhaps fallen to that deception. So that's one of the remedies. The, the other remedy for legalism is understanding biblical freedom. Yes. We don't understand biblical freedom. And so we use the very thing that awakens sin in order to combat sin. So, um, this, this was just so funny when I, when I, when I first realized this, um, first of all, I should say that, um, freedom, the way the Bible talks about is not do whatever you want. Right. That's not freedom. According to scripture, that is license. License is hedonistic behavior. It's whatever I feel like doing. Yeah. Um, 
Eleanor Roosevelt said, with freedom comes responsibility, and which is a really pithy way of saying what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6 and 1 Corinthians 10. He said, all things are permissible, mm -hmm. right? So that's freedom. But then he said, not everything is beneficial. So yeah. that's responsibility. So there's your boundary line. I, yes, I'm free to do anything. But if it's not going to benefit me, like, yes, I can eat as many Oreos as I want, but that's not going to benefit me. So I'm going to curb that impulse to eat the whole, I, I love Oreos. I don't buy them because I can't control them. <laughs> so, right. That's self-control. Freedom is self-control. He wow. says, everything is permissible. That's freedom, but I will not be enslaved by anything. Wow. So, like if you can't control your, you know, TV watching, it might not be a great idea to get like a Netflix subscription. It's like, I, I can't control watching TV. So I'm not going, I'm going to put a boundary on myself. Freedom um, also is not doing anything that, so let's see, all things are permissible, but not all things are constructive to good character or, or edifying for the spiritual life. So if you know, this is not going to build you up in the spirit, like if scrolling TikTok, is not going to build you up in the spirit. And it's not, you're going to see things you're going to, then maybe you shouldn't do that. Or maybe you should filter what you're, you're seeing. So freedom is self-control. The only control allowed in scripture is self-control. Yeah. So in control <laughs> imposed, control imposed on us by others is illegal in the kingdom. The only thing that comes close to controlling us in scripture outside of ourselves is the love of Christ. Yeah. So um, the, the Bible says that, um, where is that verse? It says, yeah, 2 Corinthians 5, 14, that the love of Christ compels us. Mm -hmm. So even the love of Christ doesn't control us, but right. it compels us. It's so beautiful. It's so, he's just so good that this love that he has, it's what urges us. It's what compels us. It's what overwhelms us into obeying him. There've been so many things that he's told me to do. Not so many, but there've been some things he's told me to do in the last two years. And I'm like, I don't want to do that. That scares me. That's going to be hard. And he just continued to love me to the point where I'm just like, I'm just like, I love you so much. It's my honor to do this hard thing because I love you. I want to show you that I love you. But that's what Jesus said to his disciples, John 14, 15. If you love me, you'll obey my commandments. So even his love doesn't control us, but it does compel us. The only thing that's allowed to control us is ourselves. Mm. And so legalism is a control mechanism that is just absolutely illegal in the kingdom of God. And so understanding freedom, um, we can't get like talking about freedom is a two hour conversation in and of itself. But if people want to do their own study, freedom is a balance between two extremes. So I, 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 I've said that on one side of freedom is legalism and on the other side is license. Well, on the one side of freedom is love for others. And on the other side of freedom is the control of others. So part of freedom is knowing when to make yourself a slave to someone else. So curbing your freedom so you don't harm their fragile, weak faith or cause them to stumble. And you can read about that in 1 Corinthians 8, 9 and the second half of 10, how Paul's like, it is it is not right to use your liberty in such right. a way that you would harm the, the, the weak, fragile and young faith of others. So we make ourselves a slave to others. We curb our freedom. But then the other side of freedom is rejecting the control that others would impose on us. So you can read about that in um, 1 Timothy 4 and Galatians 6 is we must absolutely uh, reject people making a slave out of us. Yes. So it, it's a balance. Freedom is a balance and it's situational. Yes. There's no rule book. There's no list of rules that's going to tell you what to do in every situation. That's why you have to be led by the spirit yes. in every situation. Okay. So every situation you face, Holy Spirit, should I make myself a slave to this person because of their faith? Or is this person kind of trying to control, manipulate me and I should reject that and I should exert my freedom because the earth, the world needs to see what the freedom of Christ looks like. And every situation is a balance between those two things. And that's what I want to teach my generation is how to be spirit led. And yeah. 
the spirit led by knowing his voice, recognizing his voice. So there has to be a reawakening, awakening of recognizing how he speaks, because the Bible says that no one knows a man, the inner thoughts of a man, except for the spirit of man. So no one knows the deep and inner thoughts of God, except the spirit of God. And so God has a plan for your life. And the only, only, only one who knows that plan for your life is the spirit of God. And so the, of God is the only thing that can lead you into your identity and destiny, not even the most well-meaning parent or pastor can lead you into your destiny and your, and in your identity, only the spirit of God can do that. So we have to know what the spirit of God is saying and yeah. it's situational. So if we were leading people in biblical freedom, and then everyone should read Romans 14 to, as well, because as we are walking out our, our freedom in Christ daily deciding do I make myself a slave to others in this situation or do I resist being coming a slave of others? Um, and as we walk in our liberty in Christ, Romans 14 is all about do not fall into judgment of how other people are displaying their freedom, because if they they rise and fall, um, I think it's Romans 14, four, if they stand and fall before their master and they're approved by their master, what does your opinion have to do with it? So keep your eyes on yourself. Don't judge. We're allowed to discern, yes. but we're not allowed to judge. And if you discern that your brother's in sin, pray for them. But guess yes. what? All scripture is given. It's it's breathed by God and it's given and it's profitable for teaching and instruction and correction. Like your opinions don't come into it. So right. if you see like your brother might be in sin, right? Um you can pray for them and ask God for discernment, but let the scriptures correct your brother and sister. If they're not meeting your opinion on something, yeah. Romans 14, one says, do not quarrel over opinions. So, so this is just like such a beautiful blueprint for how to walk out our Christian liberty so in love and honor. And, and I believe that because so many of us have not truly become who God's created us to be. This earth is suffering because we're not in our destiny. And if you're not in your destiny, you're not establishing the kingdom of heaven on earth. And that's what we've been commissioned to do. And so the earth is literally groaning, like look around the church is losing this battle right now, like big time. Right. And so there just needs to be a reawakening because um, the earth is crying out for God's sons and daughters to be revealed. That's so good. Your your voice carries so much weight. And with everything that you said, there's so much layer, so many layers and experience. You're not talking from a textbook, you know, right. speaking from experience and the scriptures behind them. And I really like that because gosh, your generation, our generation, we need to hear more and more of living in freedom and not being a man pleaser and living in meekness and humility. Um, which is, it's hard. It's yeah. hard. You know, it, it is, it is difficult, mm -hmm. uh, but you I know, think one of the things that legalism has deceived us into believing is that we need to be nice and non-confrontational. Like that was one of the things that I really struggled with. Like, this is going to rock the boat. This I'm going to be called rebellious. I'm going to be upsetting some things, but if you look at the first century church, that didn't come into it. <laughs> that didn't, that didn't come into the equation at all. You no. look at, uh, you look at Stephen. Um, Stephen was the first martyr and the Bible says that he was full of grace and power. So we get, we get back to grace, right? Grace is not just God's unmerited favor. It's his power to do what he's called us to do. It gives us the courage to do the hard things. Right. And so the Bible says that Stephen, he was full of faith, full of the Holy spirit, full of grace and power. Those who disputed him could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he spoke. His face was like an angel during his unfair trial. Like he, he had a fake trial. They drummed up fake witnesses against him, right? His face was like an angel during that. And then he spoke so clearly the truth of God. It was powerful. It was persuasive. And then he was clearly not afraid of being stoned. Because he was stoned and he had an open vision before he died and then had the wherewithal to ask God to forgive his persecutors. Like this is grace. Yeah. This, this is grace and power. And so he was rocking the boat. He was rocking the religious system 
but the grace of God enabled him to do that. And so that's what the Lord showed me is like, my people are courageous people. The righteous are as bold as lions, 28, uh, Proverbs 28, one, Daniel 11, 32, the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. So he, he just broke that off of me. I'm not asking you to be nice, be kind, be gentle. Um, but following me doesn't mean you're not going to be controversial. <laughs> like I'm asking you to obey and let me deal with the consequences. I am your shield. I am the, the Bible says that the fear of the Lord is a snare, but those who I'm sorry, the fear of man is a snare, but those who fear of the Lord are safe. Mm, that's so good. That's so good. And oh my gosh, you've said so much. And, and I'm going to think about a lot of the things that you mentioned in this and, and re-listen to it, because like I said, it is layered. So mm -hmm. you have a book that's coming out and tell us when the launching is. I don't know yet. So the book's not done. So um, I would say it's about 65% of the way done. And I, I, I believe that I don't know the process of like how long it takes for things to be published. So I'm hoping by the end of this year or early next year, it'll be available, but everything I've said here will be in it so that people can actually use it and study the scriptures themselves and, and just kind of use it as a manual for this, 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 I believe it's a, 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 a reawakening. I, I believe it's a revelation that's yeah. so needed in this time more than ever. God's people need to be free in this hour that we're in. Absolutely. And, and in closing, you know, as I look and see what's going on in the world, I wonder, gosh, what are people going to do that are reliant on the church? And they haven't been the church inside. We are the church. Um, and so I, I wonder, you know, with identity, how much work the Holy Spirit is going to need to do inside uh, to get people into their true identity and walking in the newness and the freedom in Christ. Uh, uh -huh. Because we're not, we're not Christians because we go to church. We're not Christians because, you know, it's an everyday, you wake up in the morning and there he is. I mean, he never leaves us. And um, on my refrigerator, I have a quote from William Paul Young, and it says, live in the grace of today. There's grace for today. There's an allotment for today of grace. Let's use it all up. Let's use that grace up today. And it may, you know, the Holy Spirit is so multicolorful. And what does that look like? What is that grace going to look like? And what's needed for today? Because it's there. So right. you know, we're not future tripping on what's going to happen tomorrow, next week, next year, or whatever. But we're going to live in the grace of today and uh, and know that Jesus is always, always there. And gosh, Ashley, Ashley thank you so much. Thank you, Teresa. This has been wonderful. Yes, we'd love to have you back when your book comes out or even before then, we'll schedule another time and we'll do a part two. Uh, but thank you for joining us and for pouring into this community. It's been my honor. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Awesome.